yes, let's take a few minutes to just enjoy and appreciate our togetherness in this virtual compa, in this virtual temple. connecting with each other as human beings with feelings and we all struggle as always and we all have this amazing potential of buddha nature so even if we don't know each other personally, some of us that do, but there's a deeper level of the human brother and sisterhood where we can feel the heart connection to each other. And it's so beautiful to take some time to meet with people who have the same bodhicitta intention, the intention to wake up, to grow up, and then to show up in the world as a source for, of love, as a source of healing. It's, it's a wonderful to um, connect uh, with other people like that over the big ocean to Europe and Anne is also here, she's representing Africa. <laughs> Yeah, and our, in our virtual temple, we are protected you know, by the teachings of the Buddha, and by the presence of His Holiness in Lama Sopa. And it's possible to have a sense uh, right now to step into a sacred space uh, right now, right there where you are. So there's no need to go to other places on the sacred space. Your vacha seat, your bodhi tree is right there in daily life in your living room. Including your cat and Possibly children in the background, or a partner, or plants. And that's the pure land. And in order to make that a felt experience, I invite you to really drop into your body and welcome what you bring with you into this moment. So staying with your awareness in the group and in the temple, but also bringing yourself along as you are and you're really welcome as you are. So we don't need to put on a face, a spiritual face or something like that. So in the Mahayana temple of His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Sopa, we are really welcomed, welcomed as we are with our pain, our struggle and our fears. and uh, with our capacity uh, to love unconditionally.
And the topic of this little series is um, our relationship to fear or anxiety. Yesterday we looked upon the practice with fear or anxiety within the Hinayana, Shavakayana, Suprayana point of view. And on that level of practice, it seems that uh, so-called afflictive emotions, kleshas in Sanskrit, uh, that they are troublemakers and our practice is about to kind of get rid of them or uh, to let go of them. First through provisional antidotes like loving kindness meditation, or something like that. And then on a deeper level through the insight into no self. And the insight that the sense we have that there is a separate, solid, autonomous me or I somewhere in the body mind system. So by looking through that illusion, by recognizing that as made up, as something we create, something we put extra on what is happening in the present moment. By looking through that, fear will dissolve because we start to see that there's nothing to protect. There's nothing to defend here, except what you made up. What might be a bit challenging on that level of practice is it kind of can, particular for us, because we have this sense that something is wrong with me. So many of us, we are not really comfortable with who we are and there's a lot of self-critic, self-judgment. So this Sinayana, Sutayana approach is precious, but it uh, can cause a certain sense of fear or suppression or suspicious attitude towards feelings. For example, anger, but also fear, desire, So we might develop a bit of a suspicious attitude towards our inner life. And it does not really work (laughs) to get rid of um, these movements of our subtle energy body. But also within these movements, emotions uh, from the tantric point of view are seen as emotions are seen as movements of the subtle energy body. And that's where also our vitality is. So in fear and anger and desire, there's a lot of vitality. And by trying to suppress that or trying to get rid of that, we lose that vitality, the gift, the wisdom within our emotions can lead into a kind of depression. Because it's it's impossible to not feel the anger, but then wanting to feel the joy. It's either all one or nothing. So we get into a kind of depressed state, disconnected from our feelings. So in the Mayana approach, uh, so-called difficult emotions, they are not seen as enemies to overcome, but as opportunities, as stepping stones to develop genuine compassion, genuine kindness. 
So it is our own experience of fear. It's, it's uh, through our own experience how difficult it is, it is to be human. It's impossible, difficult. I mean, we should bow to each other that we made it so far to this really difficult life. So by developing compassion and kindness, warmth towards your own struggle, towards your own feelings, that then makes it possible to extend that compassion, that kindness towards others. So fear ceases to become an enemy, uh, to be an enemy, it becomes a way to develop tenderness, respect, appreciation towards others, first towards yourself. That's always where we need to start, of course. But it makes sense to recognize that the way you relate to your own grief, to your own vulnerability, to your own fears. That's also the way you will relate to the fear, the vulnerability and the struggle in other people. So if you are hard with yourself because you experience anxiety, if you feel that there's something wrong with you because you experience anxiety, if uh, the experience of anxiety is unbearable, then of course you bring that attitude towards the anxiety, the fear, the struggle in another person. You would you would want to fix it. You want you would want to give advice and not space, not loving awareness, which is the ultimate medicine in the Mayana. The ultimate medicine is unconditional love. Not fixing, not applying antidotes, not trying to change how you feel or how another person feels. Loving presence is the most precious gift you can give to yourself and then automatically it will happen that you will share that with others. If you feel more comfortable under your skin as a human being with feelings, then you will be more comfortable around people with feelings. If you're uncomfortable with your own anxiety, you will be uncomfortable with the anxiety in another person. It will be unbearable to be around a partner who is scared. And you will have a sense and will give the partner the sense that something is wrong with you. You shouldn't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. It's important to recognize that what turns an experience into suffering is the resistance to what is happening. So as soon as we relax the resistance to what is happening and finding a yes, like we tried yesterday, approaching the yes, gravitating to the yes, and exploring how deep your yes can be to your own fear and to the fear of the people around you, that relaxes the resistance. And with that, suffering decreases. So the practice in the Mayana tradition, one of the practices within the Mayana tradition is Tonglen, the giving and taking practice of approaching that which is difficult with the in-breath and giving what is needed, giving relief with the out-breath. And there's many ways to practice Tonglen. 
and I will follow a bit the structure of how Pema Shudran is teaching Tonglen. She describes Tonglen in four steps. But uh, before I give a short explanation of the practice, and then I will lead the practice, let's take 10, 15 minutes to arrive more deeply in the present moment. So first is that you take your seats, the vacha seat as a son or daughter of the Buddhas, like just like the Buddha did under the Bodhi tree. So with that posture of taking the seat as a practitioner, you make the commitment to be here and to be with whatever arises, well, just like the Buddha stayed seated when Mara arrived in his, in, in his disguises. So in the posture, there is a uprightness, a kind of, I have the right to be here, this is my place, or settling the body like a mountain. And the other, the other aspect is a tenderness and openness a kindness or in all meditation, the most important thing is Maitri, a friendliness. And then if you like, you can close your eyes. If you keep your eyes open, your gaze is relaxed without particularly looking at something. And then you take your time to make contact with your inner life with what you bring with you. Your awareness or your attention drops into the body, initially even down into your feet and into your legs and you notice the surface which is carrying you. It's kind of shifting gear from doing, from trying to control, from fixing, to being here in present moment awareness. There's also a shift from the head into the body, from the conceptual way of living, always living in stories, in the narratives, uh, to a more immediate, experience of what is happening in the present moment. And it might be helpful if you bring the breath somewhat into the foreground, and not in, in the sense of concentration, but without any effort, Gently, just start to notice the breath a little bit more. And allow the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath to become a little more deeper than usual. And then with the in-breath sliding into the body, into the trunk of your body, dropping into the body, into the trunk of your body. And then with the out-breath softening, in the belly, in the shoulders, in the face. And then after the out breath, notice the little gap, the pause.
and then receive the in-breath as a gift of life. And notice the nurturing qualities of the in-breath. Drinking the nectar of life. in a dialogue. It's probably continuing, but I invite you to take it less serious, not listening so much. And if you get entangled too much in the, on the conceptual level in the head, well, with the next in-breath, you just gently let go and you slide back, you drop back into present moment awareness. Appreciating the aliveness in the body and appreciating that you are happening. And let's remember that we're breathing together. Then again, I want to remind you that whatever we experience right now, including the unpleasant, the tense or the restless or the tired, that all of that are appearances within awareness, within consciousness. Just like a dream is an appearance within the consciousness of the dreamer, in exactly the same way, this moment appears vividly. The sense of the body, this voice, your own thoughts, your feelings, the sense of the room around you. But all of that is appearances within awareness, within consciousness, just like in a dream. with the out breath into openness, into vastness. A moment of stillness, a gap at the end of the out breath. And then you're being breathed, you receive the in breath.
And then I invoke the presence of the Buddha, the Dalai Lama, Lama Sopa, into the space of awareness. Other mentors, Bodhisattva angels like Tara. And if you're a visual person, you can have a mental image of them. The more important is that you have a sense that the field of our virtual gompa, of our awareness, is filled with the healing light of bodhicitta. Like the Eastern morning sun rising after a night of terror. And you're just bathing in the morning sun, warming in the morning sun. If you remember the voices of His Holiness or Lama Sopa or the mentors, you hear them. And there's even the scent of loving kindness, maybe like roses in the air. And you bring yourself along just as you are. You are completely looked through and seen and unconditionally loved. And whatever experiences arise within that, there might be aspects of you who resist or who are afraid or bored or too tired. They are welcomed. They can be here in the healing space of bodhicitta in the healing space of all the Buddhas. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Sopa, the Buddha, Tara, they are just symbols, archetypical symbols of your own Buddha nature. And in this way, you more and more gravitate to a place of rest, just to rest. So you do less and less. For bathing and love, you don't need to do anything. Just allow. You give yourself the permission to be infinitely loved. Nothing needs to change. Everything is what it is. You just don't add to it or you try to get rid of something. So you relax the grasping, just being here, present moment awareness. And with the in-breath, you can bring warmth and kindness into the body. And with the out-breath, you extend it into the group.
And then the refuge field dissolves and the healing energy fills your body completely from the toes to the top of your head. Every cell of your body opens like a flower in the morning sun. Particularly at heart level. If you're a visual person, you can feel, see the presence of the Dalai Lama, the Buddha, or Lama Sopa, Tara in your heart. An indestructible sun of love and wisdom, wanting to shine. Your heart opens like a flower. And Buddha's love, the Dalai Lama's love, Amasopa's love pours into your body from your very center. Particularly in the areas of yourself where your heart, where you're afraid, where you're hurt. And then the healing light starts to shine through the pores of your body into all direction. Here, from heart to heart, from Buddha to Buddha, Buddha in this group. But then in ever increasing circles into your world, into your relationship, into your past, present and future. You are the light of love, which is shining upon the relative self, the relative me, and then into the areas of your love, into the areas of your life where more love, more healing is needed. You feel how through your eyes and through your mouth, through your hands, through your feet, through your belly, love is streaming. From the Buddha within, from the Tara within. In this moment, you're connected with everything, boundaryless, centerless. And gazing with the gaze of Avalokiteshvara Shemrezik. looking upon all beings, including yourself, with tenderness. And that's why we're here in the Mayana temple to make contact with the indestructible sun of wisdom and love in the center of our being and to show up in the world from that. For the benefit of all.
this. And then if you have your eyes closed, you'll take your time to open your eyes. Not, uh, not in the sense that the meditation is finished now. It's just another way of meditating, including the visual field. You stay connected with the felt sense of your body as it is now. And maybe it's possible to keep some awareness that there's always an option to look upon what is happening with tenderness, with kindness, with friendliness, with care. So I will give a bit of an explanation to the practice of Tonglen, giving and taking. Taking, taking in that what we usually reject, uh, taking in the difficult and giving that which we usually want to keep for ourselves. So it's really, a counter instinctual move, the practice of Tonglen. It's a wonderful practice to become aware of the prison of the narrative self, which main, which main mantra is, what about me? What can I get out of this for me? So in Tonglen, the question is really different. It's more the question of how can I contribute? How can I help in this situation, in this relationship? So the narrative self is always asking the question, how can serve a, another person or a situation or a relationship? How can it serve myself? What can I get out of this for myself? And Tonglen asks a very different question. What can I give? What can I contribute? How can I help? Mm, there's different, many different ways um, to practice Tonglen. It's a very creative practice. And I guess some of you already know the practice. If you don't, don't know this practice, I hope I, make you, I will make you a bit curious because it's really one of the hard practices within the Tibetan tradition and it is a practice which can, can be done in a formal way, but it's also a beautiful practice for daily life. And when you become more familiar with the practice of Tonglen, it becomes a way of living. Yeah, so it, it can cease to be like a formal practice. So now I practice Tonglen, it's more a way of being in different situations. I have a playlist on my SoundCloud profile uh, about Tonglen. So if you are interested to get kind of different varieties and, and it's so important to experiment so that you find your own way in this. And so there's a lot of space for experimentation and really finding a way to do it so that uh, you feel it is meaningful for you. So uh, Pema Shudrin, uh, who, who is really into Tonglen, so you find the practice of Tonglen in, in all her books, in, in a way, in, in all her books. And she describes uh, four steps. And the first one is a glimpse of Buddha nature. 
So this is very important. It is connected with also what I talked about yesterday that in psychotherapy and what, but also in Buddhist practice, what we have to do first is we have to connect with the resources. We have to, we have to, and a lot of the Buddhist teachings within the progressive path within the Lam Rin, they are about actually you know, connecting us with resources, you know, starting with the meditation posture and refuge and bodhicitta and guru yoga and you know, maybe protector practice and uh, precious human life and so on. You know, the contemplation on Buddha nature. So all these things is so important before we step into the fire of difficult feelings before we start any healing work, uh, we need to connect with the resources. And so that's expressed in the first step, you know, a glimpse of Buddha nature. And of course, you know, with the years of exploring the nature of mind uh, and so on, it becomes more and more easy uh, to have a sense of a fundamental well-being which is in the background all the time and that's what you connect with the sense of that within your being which never was heard the, the sense of in your being of a source of indestructible wisdom and love which remains untouched from whatever is happening. So that's the deepest level of refuge. So when we take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha on the deepest, most profound level, we take refuge into that. We take refuge into ourselves, not into the sense of the narrative uh, scared me, but in, in, we take refuge into the real self. And in our meditation, um, I will invite you to use a symbol in, in, at your heart. Um, and yes, one, one could you know, use the Buddha or Taras, or it doesn't matter, but what, I, um, what I'm going to use is a lotus. And within that lotus is a diamond, an indestructible diamond. So the lotus is symbolizing bodhicitta and the indestructible diamond in that lotus is symbolizing wisdom. And wisdom here, always the wisdom of seeing things how they really exist. So, of course, some people are more visual, some not, so it's not so important. So it's, it's, it's about getting a sense of that undestructible core, that uncorruptible core of your being, the so, you know, like, like kind of the, the source of your care of your love, which is so resilient, is so amazing, so resilient. And the diamond and the lotus is just a symbol for that. So the second step is stepping into the claustrophobic, claustrophobic experience of, in our case, of anxiety. So we are going to practice Tonglen with another person. It's also good to start with yourself, but it's, it's a little easier to get to know this process when we first start with another person. Also for many people initially, it could be a bit more easier to develop tenderness and love and kindness to another person as to yourself. 
So different approaches. Uh, traditionally in the texts on Tonglen, it is said, start with yourself uh, in the seven point mind training and, and other uh, traditional texts. But uh, maybe it's a bit easier for some to connect with another person. So we are going to choose a person who is experiencing anxiety and we don't need to look far there. Um, so probably you have uh, people like that, and, you know, people in crisis. And we, we, we just uh, practice with a particular person. So the first step, the second step here in the, in the Tonglen practice is to feel the feelings. To kind of imagine what kind of worries go through this, the mind of the person. How does this person feel? To really step into that room. This is very important. Uh, to feel your feelings, to feel the feelings. You know, once we have learned some techniques like Tonglen, there might be the tendency to kind of uh, bypass that step. Yeah. So we have a difficult feeling like anxiety, yeah, boom, meditating on emptiness. And often that is just another escape. So before we do any other kind of practice like deconstructing, transforming in the Tantrayana or mm, reflecting on, uh, on no self and stuff like that, it's so important to also just take the time to feel your feelings, just to step in there, step into the fire. And to be aware of all the aspects of you who do, don't want to come with you. Yeah? The, the parts who resist, the parts who are afraid, the parts who are bored, the parts who are tired, the parts who are not interested. To so just be aware of them. And then the third step is uh, the giving and taking. Yeah, so here, the taking is uh, to you know, lightly connect it with the breath. We don't need to, particularly if you're a perfectionist, forget about the breath. No, it's, it's just a light, it's a, it's a symbolic connection. Yeah? So with the, the, the taking in, it's like, so you take in the pain. So you, you take in the pain, not into your conditioned relative mini-me, you take the pain in into the sky-like nature of your Buddha nature. That's where you take it. And the narrative self, the structure of the narrative self will resist that, of course, and it can't do it. I mean, from the point of view of the narrative self, we wouldn't be able to open our heart even to only one person. Not talking about the suffering of all beings. So that's why it's so important that in the first step, we are connecting with the sky. And that's where we take in. And we take in into the, in the form of black smoke. And we are not going to alternate giving and taking. We will spend some time in the taking, in the breathing in. And while you're doing that, and I, I will guide this, you don't need to remember. You kind of, you lift the weight or from the other person. So you start to see the other person changing. And then giving. So the giving is giving relief, but it could be also more specific. You know? I mean, we can be really very creative here. The giving, you know, there could be words, it could be gifts, it could be time, it could be you know, anything which would relieve uh, the suffering of, of that person. 
And then the fourth step is to extend the circle of love. So then there is like the kind of the, the one of the core teachings within the Tonglen practice is this moment where you see that there's so many others in the same situation. So if you practice Tonglen with yourself, kind of in a nutshell, in a nutshell, Tonglen with yourself would be, oh, this is a difficult moment. This is how I feel right now. I'm, I'm scared. And I'm not alone with this. So it's like this, what about me? Oh, my fear, and it's also terrible. And so my life, and what's going to happen for me? And to, this is not personal. We are sitting in the same boat. So that's uh, the fourth step. So this is again, like yesterday, it's just an experiment. And if you haven't done this practice, you know, it takes some time to, to get used to it. Just follow along, uh, but also give space to your own experience. So, you know, my instructions say, it shouldn't be like a straight jacket, you know, where you try to, to do it right. It's, it's just, you know, to just playing along and seeing what happens. Right? having some openness, some curiosity, and, uh, and also knowing that, you know, you need to find your own way in this. Of course, it's important to receive teachings on how to do it, but then it needs to be your own piece of art, like your own really personal Tonglen practice with, uh, with the instructions and visualizations which makes sense to you. We are also different. We all have different needs and we respond to different kind, kinds of images and words. So it's important to receive that kind of teachings from different kinds of teachers and explore this practice. So before we start, is there any uh, question uh, regarding what I said around the practice? Some doubts you have or Okay, so let's start. So we take the seat. This is, is actually important. And even if you are like an experienced meditator, you know, take your time to really be curious about the seat, you know, how you sit, how, the, how your posture is. Play a bit with it you know, so that it stays alive and resonates with the mood of the day and where you are in your life. So posture is really a territory to explore. And then take your seat as in this lineage, in the, in the lineage of the Tonglen practitioners who since, I don't know, thousands of years have taken this seat just like us now. Yeah. And uh, when you take that seat, you're always protected. So you take your seat and then you're surrounded by the protectors of the lineage. You're not alone. And we can be sure right now that there's thousands of Tonglen practitioners all over the world who do this practice. It's also part of Christian practice, you're taking your course. So you're never alone in this practice. Yes, and then if you like, you can close your eyes. It'll take a few moments to slide into the body again. Noticing the in-breath dropping into the body. Welcoming 
the guests in the guest house of the body. And allow yourself to breathe a little deeper than usual, not forceful. Let yourself be breathed. And if you get distracted throughout the meditation, you return to the felt sense of your body and the flow of the in and out breath. The first step, the glimpse of the Buddha nature, I invite you to feel, imagine in your chest, in your heart chakra, a beautiful lotus. And in that lotus is a diamond, the perfect diamond, indestructible. the scent of the lotus. And the sparkling diamond. So I might gently breathe into the heart area. And with the experience of the diamond and the lotus, there's the confidence that whatever arises, whatever is being touched by this diamond and the lotus is being healed, is being transformed. So there's a big confidence in, in your undestructible goodness. It's the healing source within you symbolized by the diamond and the lotus. And then you invite one person someone who is struggling or is experiencing anxiety fear and uh, settle with one person for this experiment and say his or her name And uh, maybe you're not so much a visual person, but feel the presence of that person. Hear her, him, as if she, if, as if she or he is present. So, and then you open to the suffering of this person. That's the first step, or the second step. So you, you kind of, you, for, for a few moments, you walk into the, uh, you, you walk with the feet of that person, in the feet of that person. What are the fears, the worries? Really try to step into that space.
I'm not trying to find solution. I'm just feeling, just imagining. And if you do that, you probably feel within the felt sense of your own body. Various you keep some awareness on the breath, so you stay in the aliveness of your body. And then we go into the third step, uh, starting with the taking. And here we imagine the suffering, the fear, the anxiety as a dark cloud within the person, pervading that person, the experience of that person. And then with the next in-breaths, we kind of suck that dark cloud. It's like dark smoke, something like that. And we draw that dark cloud towards us. And it starts together in front of us. And while we're doing it, we notice the person changing, as if a boulder is lifted from the shoulder of that person. So more the dark cloud of anxiety is leaving that person and drifting towards you more joyful that person becomes, more glowing, more vital. And this dark cloud, this dark smoke is gathering as a little ball, like a tennis ball in front of your face. And really see the other person starting to light, lighten up, to heal. And the black smoke is gathering in front of your face as a dark bowl. So a couple of more breaths. We'll get a sense that the darkness has left the other person and all his or her suffering is now just in front of you. So 
So before we do the next step of really taking the suffering in, we can remind ourselves the lotus and the diamond in our heart. So just bring your awareness to that for a few moments. The lotus symbolizing bodhicitta, diamond symbolizing the wisdom of realizing emptiness. And they are just resting there like they always do. And then when you're ready, with the intention to really take the suffering upon you, to take it away from that person. With one deep in-breath, you breathe in that bowl. And it streams towards the diamond and the lotus. And in the moment it touches the diamond and the lotus, there is that lightning of love, that lightning of wisdom. And the darkness disappears forever because it is recognized as empty. And it is met with essence love with unconditioned love. So maybe you need to repeat that a few times, really taking the darkness in. It's touching the diamond and the lotus and disappears forever. And the lotus and the diamond are just resting unchanged. So, and then we start the giving. So from the lotus and the diamond, from the Buddha nature, the core of your being, with the next out breaths, you breathe a cloud of goodness, you breathe a cloud of healing, you breathe, you, you breathe out a cloud of light, of nectar towards the other person. So you give all your joy, all your love, all your goodness with each out breath like a cloud can be also imbued with the scent of roses or other healing scents. And you just bathe that person from the lotus and the diamond. And you really change the image of that person. The person becomes so happy, so radiant. So free. So with each out breath, you just give all your goodness, your generosity, your care, your warmth, your healing.
and the other person is so happy. She does not understand what is happening, but suddenly the cloud, the heaviness, the darkness is gone. And everything is lightening up for him, for her. She sees the world in different ways and he sees her himself in different ways. So and then after a while, you suddenly start to notice that also the other person has a diamond and a lotus, the center of his or her heart. So wonderful. So far, maybe you have seen that person as a suffering being, maybe almost hopeless. You suddenly see, yeah, there is also that indestructible, uncorruptible core. And you start to feel it, you start to see it. And there's a bridge of light from diamond to diamond, from lotus to lotus. And both of us, we are starting to lighten up. As an expression of the diamond and the lotus. And then the fourth step is extending the circles of love. And we can start here with us and our group. From heart to heart, from diamond to diamond, from lotus to lotus. Breathing together. Breathing in, healing, and breathing out, healing. Bridges of light from heart to heart, the network. And then we extend these circles of life into our relationships. Bridges of light from Buddha nature to Buddha nature, to your children, to your parents, even if they have passed, to your friends, to your pets. To the people you work with. They all suffer, but they also have Buddha nature. And then we extend this network, this heart network from diamond to diamond, from lotus to lotus, into our city, into our country. into the world, to all feeling beings, including the animals. With the in-breath, receiving healing. With the out-breath, 
giving you May all beings be happy. May all beings feel safe. May all beings experience peace. The small ones and the big ones, the powerful and the weak, the far and the near, the visible and the invisible. May all beings be happy. May all beings feel free. May all beings be safe. And may people everywhere look after each other, including the animals. May people everywhere look after each other. When you take your time to open your eyes. Allowing the view of the lotus and the diamond come through your eyes. So that's one of the ways to do this practice. And if you become more familiar with this, it is actually something which you, you will notice uh, will happen in daily life. So not with all these visualizations, but uh, just like a sense uh, of living where in each situation supported by the in-breath, you are just present to what is. You, you let it in. You feel your feelings. And then with the out-breath, giving relief, care, kindness. Kindness, maybe it's a good word here. So it's, it's not a big deal then. No? I mean, in terms of visualizations or this is the way of being more open to, you, to yourself and to what is happening around you because you are not afraid of being a human being with feelings. And you're not afraid of the feelings of other people. So you can be there, you can be open to the situation, you can breathe it in instead of blocking because feelings are too much. Feelings seem to be something bad.
and then with the out breath, loving awareness. So the the practice in in its different ways can be done with situations in the past. So you can imagine yourself back then, 10 years ago when you went through your divorce or you lost your job and there's still unfelt feelings. There's still grief left, there's still bitterness, there's still a lack of forgiveness towards yourself. There's also practice you can use into with you know inner child inner child healing, and you can also practice it with yourself right in the moment. You know? One way to do is to kind of you know step out of yourself and you look at yourself and you look at your so you look from a witness. You know, an awakened witness uh, at yourself. And then you do the practice of taking and giving from kind of from your future Buddha. And then you can do Tong then also with the future. So if you uh, have a different difficult meeting where you already know everyone is scared because the company is in a crisis, uh, so you have a team meeting and you're already scared about it. So it's already something which is you know, in your body and it's affecting uh, today. So that would be a great way then to kind of prepare for that meeting, not in terms of strategy, uh, but uh, you know, to breathe in the anxiety and the fear of that meeting and take it onto yourself, uh, allowing the diamond and the lotus to meet that fear. And then with the out breath, you breathe in what is needed for the meeting. And you imagine the meeting to change. So you change the mental image. You change your ment the mental image you have from yourself in the past, for example, or you change the mental image of the meeting, of the conversation you have, or of the operation, or whatever scary thing is waiting there for you in the future. One of the really powerful, important gift in the practice of Tonglen is it is then a practice you can do if you have the fortune and many of us will have the fortune to be around someone dying. We will all lose the people we love. And it's so important when that time comes and it will come it's not, it's not like bad luck uh, if someone dies in the family. It's, it's what happens and it will happen to all of us. In, and it's good to have, you know, to have a heart practice, which is already there so that you don't need to go to your bookshelf and look into advice on how to support uh, dying people or something. Yeah, so, but there's already something which is familiar to you, something you like, and something which is natural, almost so natural that you kind of, you don't need to practice it anymore. It becomes part of your being in the world because you're so familiar with it. And then, uh, this is so, I mean, this is so helpful for yourself, but obviously also for the person. Because you, you might 
be then the one person in your family who is not breaking, who is not breaking down, but who is contributing to the situation with tenderness, with care, and with the capacity to feel your feelings. That's the most important thing. And then you can, you can practice uh, Tonglen while the person is sick, while the person is uh, uh, dying. And, uh, and then also after. So when the person, you know, when, when a loved one dies, this person will visit us frequently in our thoughts and our feelings with, with, their, with the presence of the, that person. And then we always know what to do. That is then always the moments where we practice Tonglen. We take on the suffering of that person and we give healing light or whatever makes sense to you uh, to that person. What is also so beautiful in this practice, I mean, first, I mean, this practice contains bodhicitta, but it also contains you know, the wisdom, the wisdom, realizing emptiness, realizing no self, re realizing no separation, that, that, that this sense we have that we are separated from the pain in the world. Um, so it's also addressing that. And it makes such a difference when you are a support person, uh, you know, supporting someone, uh, that you don't lose sight of the Buddha nature of that person. And we have this tendency to see the, the conditioned, the relative, the, the weak, and then we identify that person with that. So recognizing your own Buddha nature, which is the first step, and then starting to see it in other people, then you come to a place where you never give up and where, where, you, where you never like feel that someone is lost or someone is without, there is no hope or something like that. See your children as that. So it's so important. They, they are fine. Of course, they have a difficult journey like everyone else, but they are fine in the same way you are fine. You are safe. And when I say you are safe, what I'm talking about is the you who you really are. And then the, the actual practical help we will give comes from such better place. You know, it, becomes from, it comes from a place of trust, a, a place of kindness and not this kind of frenetic trying to fix and trying to control and imagining that you know what's the best for that person. Then, then the words you might say or the gifts you give, they come from kindness, from tenderness, and, and from a sense that basically there's nothing to worry about. Yeah, so sorry, there was no time for questions, but you know. It's also good. It's fine. Yeah, so at the end of the meditation, we already did a kind of dedication. So we have shared the positivity, the goodness of this meeting. Yeah, might this support you? I hope you became curious about the practice and explored it a deeper. I mean, if you're someone who wants to settle with one practice, I would recommend this one. 
from the buffet of the Tibetan Buddhist teachings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Jennifer, you. For, for inviting me and for all the other people who keep the Shantideva Center running. I guess there's some here. And uh, yeah, we have another meeting uh, in two weeks or something like that, um, where I will um, look at fear a bit from the Tantrayana view. I'm not sure exactly about the practice, but I think it will be a bit of a simplified feeding the demon practice, uh, you know, following uh, Sutra Malyona's teachings you know, based on the Chö uh, teachings. So I think it, it will be something like that. Um, yeah, and then uh, I, I, uh, Jennifer, the center, invited me also to give a commentary on the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva, and that will also start, I don't know, in May or something like that, I don't know. And it will be a series of teachings for a while using uh, the translation of Ken McLeod uh, of, the, of the text. So I'm, I'm hoping to see some of you then. And uh, all the best for you. Take care. Take care Thank of the you. people around you. May the Buddhas be with you. And they are. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you in a couple of weeks. And yes. practice with you. And much gratitude, Stefan. Bye. Thank you, Stefan. I think next time it's a, the Danish summer time actually, so we also have a, a shift in time. Uh, okay. So yeah, I I notice so it. I notice on the Facebook event it makes it automatically adapts it to the time zone, so mm -hmm. I can just yeah. check there. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Much. <clears throat>